Um, okay, let me find Lisa. you've had a busy week it's been crazy it's yeah it's um it's been a doozy for sure <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a full-on shit show but it's all, yeah. it's all good <laughs> well you know it's funny how uh you know I'd started that newsletter a couple of weeks ago and uh it's it always like the I think that we're still being generative in like all of our ideas and all of like our plans. And then when we get in sort of the thick of it, we can realize, <laughs> is this really the time for me to do yeah, that as much? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been feeling the same yeah. way. Which, but I, I feel like I, I tend to do that with all my shit. At, like, I'm like, this is a great idea. Let's start it. And it's like the train takes off and it's like, wait, I'm yeah. not ready. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's good. I feel like it's also good. I feel like we've been so caught up in this perfectionist sort of way of life. I mean, I don't know if it's pre COVID or if, if that's the catalyst or what to like get to this like new way of thinking in life and stuff. But I felt like before it was like everything had to be perfect and flushed out and, you know, scheduled. And it's like, I, I've never lived like that ever. So yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why I was pretending I was anyways, but I think it's important to, to do shit and and try it and then yeah. go like you know what it's not working i have to reroute and yeah re you know change it rewire it whatever yeah so i think it's great i got i know i got your email i got the newsletter um today wasn't it today that you were yeah in? this or morning Sunday? yeah yeah i just uh yeah i had been sort of i think it's gonna be a better uh product if i can sort of stockpile content a little bit like as far as the baking videos go yeah. it's not really working like this sort of seat of my pants thing for the first time in my life like I actually want to make sure that like the the video quality is good the sound quality is good yeah <laughs> I'm, well, I'm good really... for you for being a perfectionist because well <laughs> my yeah. sound quality is shit so. <laughs> it's you know I really want uh you know I want to be able to not for for a lot of reasons but also just because i uh, i want to learn some new things you know i think i'm also like i want to take some time and actually learn a process uh like the I'm, process of uh producing it or the process yeah. of like new baking it oh cool yeah you know like learning about all of this audio editing and learning about you know producing on the back end after you record something so i'm just i want to be able to take a, a second and deep dive because the little things like the sound quality of the podcaster is really bothering me. So I'm like, well, shoot, you know, it's, it's the because, holidays. Like I may as well yeah. take three weeks and, and like get it right. You know? Well, I know some people who know some people who might be able to help you with that. So. Well, oh, good. Maybe I'll take you up on that. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, we've been at it now for a little bit and we're getting more, we're doing, we're going to be doing more of produced content too, as far as like video stuff. And yeah. Um, it's a doozy when you first start because it's really overwhelming and then the editing part is really difficult and then nitpicking it and then the yeah. back and forth and then the yeah. blah, 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 blah. and it's like ah yeah well, oh, the, sorry, woman, the woman that I interviewed Chidi Kumar on the last podcast is one of my best friends she's also a really talented musician like a really successful musician nice. and so she has experience doing audio recording and so I was really like it was, it, she was like, okay, let's look at this. And, and she was like showing me things that I hadn't thought about. And I'm like, well, I want to know all these things. And it was little tweaks here and there. So I got really in, like interested in trying to sort of think about, you know, well, this could actually be not just a hobby. This could actually be oh, 100%. Hobby, you know? so, yeah. so I don't know, just giving myself some time to get it right. <laughs> I don't blame you. I, I, I love that about you though. I mean, just reading your book. I mean, and I don't know if anyone hasn't heard of Lisa. And if you haven't, you live under a rock because her, her baking, like you are an award. First of all, you're an award winning 
pastry chef. Your writing is off the charts. You're just an amazing human being. And oh, you wrote this in fantastic, sorry, my notes, um, amazing book, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. Um, that's just phenomenal. And um, there, what I really love about it too is that you're so, I mean, talk about sustaining yourself because you're so mm -hmm. driven and you, it seems at least in your writing in your book that you know yourself so well. And if you don't, you still like advocate for yourself. That's just so wild and cool. And um, I love that. And I also love it. Like you're saying, you know, trying out this podcast and, and uh, doing video content and stuff. And in the book, when you talk about buttermilk road, Buttermilk mm -hmm. Road, is that right? Am I yeah. That? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I'm blank for a second. Um, and just starting the dinner, the Sunday dinners and stuff, and then going like, you know what? This isn't fitting. This doesn't spit well and yeah. feel right. And I'm going to pivot and turn. And then, you know, the restaurant scene with Husk and going like, you know what? This, this is bullshit. This isn't what I'm yeah. about. This isn't who I am. And I just, right. I love that. And I love right. that you write it with such honesty and... Mm. Doesn't he know we're busy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad it wasn't on my end. I was like, oh man, my bad Wi Fi is striking again. But it was oh. really good. <laughs> Mine's always bad. Now my husband's calling me. God. Um, <laughs> Jeez. 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 <laughs> what are you drinking? Well, okay. So I don't, I don't normally, well, I, I only drink really two. I drink beer. I'm not supposed to because I'm gluten free, but I love beer. But I drink two canned drinks. One is cut water, which is really delicious alcohol. I know drink, it. Which is super weird. I know. But it's really good. I, I just, I don't even know what it is. It's like cocktail in a can, which sounds like super oh. uh, ridiculous. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I love a good cocktail, but to have it in a mm -hmm. can just seems like, huh. I don't know. It's supposed to be syrupy sweet, but it's really good. And then my friend, um, Jenny Mullen, sent this wine over. And Ooh. I was like, what the fuck is this? But it's um, Jordan Sal Salcido. She's the song from Momofuku and um, Eleven Madison. Or okay. Right? So I was like, okay, I have to like. I yeah, have to it's this. probably like, great. That's a big deal. And it's actually really, really awesome. So It looks anyway, great. It's, it's wine? It's wine. It's a wine spritz. Um, mm. And it's actually really delicious because normally they're really sweet, but this is yeah. really, really good. So wine spritzes are made for cans. They're perfect for a can. I'm having yeah. a spritz too, but it's a it's kind of a white trash spritz because I didn't have any prosecco or champagne. So it's basically just bitters and soda water, which is fine. It's That's, good for my tummy. <laughs> I have some champagne here because I wasn't sure how good this is going to be. So like, I'm going on the side, but it's actually I'm delicious. I'm with a backup plan. Hell yeah. Yeah, totally. So we can double fist. Um, but it's, it's really, you got to try it. I, I'll send you some. It's really, really good. Yeah. I'm curious about it. I've never seen it. Yeah. And I love it. I actually, one of my best girlfriends always brings over canned wine. She used to bring over that Sophia and now oh, she's, yeah. she started bringing over something else for our porch wines. And I can't remember what it was called now, so but I thought she would love to try that. Well, cheers. Yeah. Thanks for having cheers. me. Cheers. Thanks Dick. for coming. <laughs> <laughs> to more. Ah. So, what's new with you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just hanging out. <laughs> um, so, I kind of start out this week with just saying sustainability. That's something that's really important to me. And sustainability, when we started deep diving into what that looks like and, it, and discussing it, it wasn't just about the environment. It wasn't about, let's take it on from the outside in, which is kind of what I've been looking at it mm -hmm from that perspective of, mm -hmm. oh, we got to tackle climate change and we have to, you know, recycle and, and do all these things and, and that'll change carbon emissions and I got to change my car and blah, blah, blah. And we, when we were, I started really discussing it with friends and colleagues and the more we talked about it, the more it was like, no, this is an internal thing. This is something that we got to fix from the inside out. So it's, it's not just like externally changing these habits and, and I'm going to recycle and I'm going to buy only, I'm going to throw everything away and whatever, but it's also like things that sustain me. So, and ourselves. So how can I 
do things that are going to make me feel better in body, mind, and spirit? And, <clears throat> and what are those things? For me, it's reading and uh, I love like good uh, yoga and meditation and moving my body and um, baking and you know those things that are like like calming and then also have like an energetic quality to them and also give back to like with books it's a book exchange exchanging ideas yeah. and <clears throat> with baking also like the materials and the ingredients and all of those things and it's like cyclical and symbiotic. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it kind of brings me here and in, in chatting with you. I mean, your book has so much sustainability in it from your advocacy for yourself and doing the things that are empowering you to move forward and propel you and the decisions that you make in your mm -hmm. life and sharing that with others, um, the way that you bake and put that into the world and mm -hmm. the way that you choose your ingredients and the people that you align yourself with. It's just, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's bigger than just like the environment. This is like, we have to talk about it in like a, a more broader term and a more mm -hmm. in a personal term at the same time. Right. Well, mm. you know, it's interesting that I think it's been an interesting um, arc, this trajectory has taken this year of, of becoming, uh, if you weren't already hyper aware of, you know, a lot of the things going on in the world, not only to mention sort of like the new information with the pandemic. And, you know, I think a lot of people um, became incredibly um, overnight aware of a world that they weren't a part of, you know, and their, 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 their borders, um, as far as the health and wellness of external communities was becoming really uh, something that people became aware of. And I think the initial response was to pour out. And I think eventually people realized that they had to start uh, making sure that their well was actually full of the right and, you know, of the right things, whether that was, you know, mental health, physical health, or just the proper education to move forward, the proper tools um, so that you can go out into the world and sort of know where you're best um, suited to, to help, mm -hmm. um, and to make change. And, um, so it's been, I think, you know, it's been an interesting, uh, just on a purely sociological level, looking at sort of how that has happened this year of watching sort of this really, uh, intense external response to, um, the world and how we need to be engaged to, to, to continue to push for the right changes to happen. And then I noticed, you know, right around like when the weather started changing, everyone turned that back inside and went back inward and, and has started having more conversations that like you're having right now, which is how do you, um, how do you sustain yourself so that you can do better for your community? Yeah. And I think it's just a, a really uh, important part of this equation. And I think it's not just, I know we're going to talk about books and reading and writing today. You know, I think there is a level of it, of course, that is like, you know, wellness in the sense of what we eat and how we exercise and how we take care of our physical bodies. But I think there's also, for me anyway, there's an element of like, sending myself back to school. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot this year I realized I am miseducated about, or I don't even know. I'm not, I'm going to a community college. It's not like I'm, you know, I've worked in kitchens my whole life. I don't have some pedigreed education and I want you don't need to, by the way, Jill Biden, Dr. Jill Biden teaches that at community college. Exactly. Community, community colleges, colleges are, are badass. Key. You know, they're key for our, our country. And so I don't know. I think, I think, uh, you know, I like, I think my initial response is to always feel a little concerned about like, um, you know, not white womanizing this and like, I'm going to do yoga and make this better. Yeah. But having the conversation about what our responsibilities are so from here and then dominoing out, I think is the key. And I think for me, I don't, I'm, I'm curious what that the answer is for you. For me, I think I recognized that what I needed to do was re-educate myself and be quiet in those spaces. And that has felt really good to me to just read books that I've never read before that 
I should have read in college or I should have read in high school, you know? And yeah. so, um, and that has helped, that's helping my writing, you know? So it's, it's a good, it's, it's good for, it's, it's, it's good for all kinds of rewards, 100%. I think. You know? Yeah, I agree with that. I think for, for me, it's, it's definitely been a lot of reading and deep diving and mm -hmm. quiet, which it, ha it has been uncomfortable in some, in some ways to like sit there and like really be silent with yourself mm -hmm. and not just like silent to think about what I'm going to do next and how I feel about X, Y, and Z, but just to not do anything. Yeah. And then also, you know, getting uncomfortable and moving forward in discomfort, understanding, like you're saying, like, you, we're not going to white woman our way out of this in a way like there, there are a million other perspectives and, mm -hmm. and that we have to really look at that I didn't necessarily even understand. Mm -hmm. um, and so talking to more people getting outside of not just this small community, but like broaden that community and figure out how we can all live together and work together and be uh, lear I'm learning from other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with environmentalism, there's such a, um, there, there was so much that I learned just by talking Green for All, which is such an eye-opening organization and talking sun trying to face home, my son. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just, you know, like intersectional environmentalism or, you know, just things that you don't even, that I didn't even understand and mm -hmm. the disparity and unfortunate um, so I'm kind of trying to articulate the, this the best way I can, but just the the way that the the elitist kind of thing that it, that sustainability is and unapproachable mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, you know as I get and deep dive more into this um, and want to make a bigger impact, just realizing mm -hmm. if we want to make a big impact, it has to be green for all, and we mm -hmm. have to be better for our communities, and that okay. starts right here. Yeah. So. Well, that's sort of the key, not sort of, it's entirely the key to understanding, uh, you know, if we can get, pull in smaller, we start so solving a ton of problems. You know, we start solving, uh, you know, we start working directly with farmers. Well, we, we have yeah. more farmers in our community. We can feed more people in our community. And, you know, and all of a sudden there's a beautiful chain reaction that can happen when we, you know, start from a much smaller square than, you know, I don't know, pretending that, you know, going to uh, a million and one uh, big events to shout in the streets. I'm, I'm a lifelong street pounding protester, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love it. Definitely. And I think there's a place for that. But I'm in a stage of my life now where that kind of work to me is, you know, okay, we'll work backwards. What's solving yeah. many problems. And for me, you know, feeding people who, you know, don't have the capacity to go and buy really expensive organic food, but connecting them to their own resources in their community where local farmers are growing food, you know, five blocks away is a huge, huge yeah. step and feeding people. And as a chef, that's a huge priority for me is to get food on people's plates and to help them have better conversations in their life about what wellness and nutrition is and that for me always starts with food and then backtracks into a bigger conversation about our environmental health and you know and so yeah I, I mean there are so many benefits to just circling your wagons centering yourself in a small space and if it gets bigger one day and you're affecting a bigger change that's incredible yeah. um but your one small move it can do a lot you know it's 100 percent yeah, and I think that's a hugely important thing for people. I think people feel overwhelmed. What do we do? How do we help? Well, you start small. Yeah. And it has to, like you're saying, start here, and then you just make a couple of small moves, and you'll find yourself in the right space, and it'll start making sense, and you'll all of a sudden understand 
you know, what the obstacles and limitations are in your own community of, you know, people having access to healthy foods and kids having, you know, more than one meal a day. Right. I know. I know. Uh -huh. Well, so, and that was so insane understanding. I mean, the fact that a lot of people weren't getting fed during the pandemic mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. school lunches and yeah, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. No Kid Hungry is a really great resource for anyone that wants to start learning about food policy, agricultural policy. Um, a lot of chefs work with No Kid Hungry to um, really bring their communities a little bit more into a space where we're having conversations about food insecurity. And um, the, so if anybody's interested, No Kid Hungry is a really great organization and it's nationwide. And they do incredible tactile boots on the ground work and they also do policy work mm -hmm. uh, in dc so it fits a lot of different uh you know if you want to if you want to go lobby in dc and that that's your thing you have the resources to do that and a lot of chefs do that through no kid hungry and then if you want to connect farmers with distribution warehouses and you know local um you know, food banks in your community, that's also an aspect. And so any chefs that are watching or anybody that's watching, you don't have to be a chef. A lot of chefs are a lot of people that are a part of that uh, organization are not chefs, but you can get involved, bring them into your community and you'll have some built in resources to help you have that conversation in your community. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I knew of them and I've I feel like um, I've worked with them, but I didn't realize the ex the expansiveness of their organization, which is fantastic. It's fantastic. And and uh, the James Beard Foundation is also doing similar um, uh, initiatives as well. They have several different kinds of large scale initiatives, but they are fundamental in educating chefs as well and how to be policy changers. This is all very political so it's it's probably very boring but <laughs> no, I don't think so at all though I think it again it's like helping our community and and one of the cool things about sustainability is that there isn't like it's not like you have to throw everything away I saw someone call me out because I had a can but look I got a recyclable like a, a reusable yeah. like there are certain things that are going to work and not work and right everyone has different changes and and we're going right. to make different changes Right. So it's something like No Kid Hungry, knowing where, what works for you mm -hmm. and what change that you can make, what, you know, maybe someone lives in DC and is like, oh, I can go and help lobby and yeah. X, Y, and Z. And, well, and I think it's, yeah. And I think it's important as a community to, I think, I think we are definitely in a space in our country where we can all maybe potentially agree that extreme forms of anything aren't getting us anywhere. <laughs> extremism yeah. is not solving any problems at this point and so if we can face where we're at in this space and time as americans and as humans on a planet that needs our help we can start to not be crazy burn it all down restart from scratch but yeah. how do we rebuild the infrastructure where we are now and we need the reality is we need our political leaders to be in step with that we need bigger help than you know grassroots is a powerful thing yeah uh, but we definitely need uh, initiatives that a start feeding people um, in our communities and then we build out that are protecting our, our pipelines that are protecting our native lands so it becomes all of a sudden you realize that when you start talking about how to keep kids fed it's 5,000 other conversations. And that's the step though. That's the real key is getting people to have that first conversation because if they go if for a few steps beyond that conversation, they're not gonna be able to not have the other conversations and that becomes yeah. how we change culture. I so know. yeah. And, and, and everyone's tolerance or everyone's um, comfort level is gonna be different. Yeah. So to continue to have these conversations right. and understand like where you fit in. and not be afraid to be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. And I ask sure. very stupid questions, but you know. and I try and I try to think about even when I'm doing baking classes or when I'm doing anything, I always think not because she's not smart, not because she's not capable, not because she's not aware or educated, but we are from different generations and we are, um, 
we do strive for different things in my life. So I always think about what my mom would want to hear or need to hear or how it would need to be presented for my mom to be yeah. excited about it. Because, 100%. you know, she comes from a generation of women that is, you know, very easily intimidated, you know, because that was how they were raised. And so I like to sort of always think about like, how would my parents hear this best? Um, and it's never through judgment. I mean, and nobody wants to be judged. You know? <laughs> well, hundred percent. And I, I think that's what's, what has been so hard about all of this is that yeah. while we're in this pandemic, we get the news, you know, and it's this or that it's right, wrong. It's red and blue. And, and it's, and yeah. again, not to get political, but I think what's so difficult is that there's this huge gap now between people and people shouting at each other as opposed to having these conversations, which has been so great about the Zoom is, is being able to chat and learn and be curious and yeah. uh, disagree, which which is really important in humanity yeah. to disagree and learn from each other. And that doesn't yeah. mean that you're bad or I'm bad or no, uh, it's I no know. bad. I mean, I literally miss, I know that there's a lot of conversations about the value of criticism in, in particular in the food world, like food critics, like what's yeah. their purpose. And I value the critic. I value yeah. the critic so much. Yeah, I think I am probably uh, deep down at heart a, a critic. Like I think I think about things and troubleshoot and I really value I think artists in particular, writers in particular, um, you know, my husband's a sculptor and we've lived in a, a very creative uh, life, <laughs> you know, for our yeah. whole marriage. I mean, he has gallery shows, our friends are artists, I have writer friends. Um, and I can remember when he was first showing uh, his sculpture out of grad school he would ha he had a gallery down in new orleans that he showed in religiously and he would get reviewed like there were art critics and a good review is great a bad review is so much more helpful right really? like, i guess you're right i mm -hmm. guess you're right it's just it's so hard i think when you put your yeah. heart out there and you're like fuck yeah but, it, but, if it's a, but if it's a critical like thoughtful yeah. educated academic and yes. thoughtfully put together it's not an insult it's not a it's not a you're shitty stop doing this it's, it's keep going yeah it's it's keep going and here's where you're being reductive or here's where yeah. you're being this or here's where you're being that which to anybody that really cares about their work is a gift yeah right i agree i agree yeah i think it's such a gift like but somewhere along the lines we lost uh, academic criticism and I think a lot of people don't value it and I know that's a big conversation in the food world like what, what do you need restaurant critics for what do we need food critics for well I for one I, I value a thoughtful review of someone who's not just you know for frankly like having a big circle jerk about how great everything is in right. town you know like every, every, no, I agree. every you know everything can't be great and no I agree then, and then I, we pussyfoot around it lately of like, no, yeah. you get an A, you get an A, you get an A. Yes. Yeah. We have turned almost, not almost, in a very short flicker of time in like the, 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 the story of humanity, we have stopped as Americans knowing the value of criticism. And I really, um, I don't want a bad review of my book, but I would love an honest review of my book. And if there were bad things in there, I would learn from that as a writer. Yeah. You know, I, I would learn. I would say, okay. And, and truly, I think like the shittiest thing about me is that I would actually trust a bad review more than I would trust. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. I, I mean, as long as it's like something that's, well, even if it's not necessarily like academic, as long as you know, I guess if it's there and you're like, oh, I see how I affected someone in that way. I didn't yeah. look at it from that perspective. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I feel like when it's good, it's like blanketed. Like that was really great. It was a positive. And you're like, well, what was great? Can you be specific about yeah. what made you feel like that or whatever? That's right. That's right. Uh, I think it's just, um, it can be enriching to have people who are, you know, generating critical thinking about yeah 
people's work. I think it, I think there's value in it. I can see why some people disagree in the food world. It is a big conversation. Um, but I'm maybe I'm old fashioned and I just no, I think you're <laughs> right. I think you're on to something. I mean, I I've been on such a kick. I've read so many food memoirs in the last few months and stuff and it seems like like with from um david chang's to i feel like yeah. who else um even ruth raquel is that how i say her name properly raquel Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you know like the how like the fear and like the accolades and and like you know i, I feel like alice waters too um she is that right with hers isn't she's um uh Shea Panis, right? Yeah, she's a Shea Panis, and, and uh, she came out with a memoir, I think, just two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. And I, I was born in the Bay Area, so I was, I remember my, like that, my family talking about the yeah. restaurant and and stuff, and but just like the accolades and like needing, like being real pissed about not getting an award, but then being pissed if they do get an award, and then the downfall yeah. and like having to live up to it, and and I, I think you're onto something if you can kind of like live in this moment of like that doesn't just only one person can win this fucking thing yeah or what I, like, <laughs> so don't maybe don't beat yourself up about it but go like well how can i learn from the criticism that they gave me and mm -hmm. like expand upon that or improve upon it as opposed mm -hmm. to like beat yourself up over it yeah i mean and you know i think uh, for someone who just was talking about the value of critical thinking and critical um writing about you know art criticism and food criticism and literary criticism. I actually, um, you know, I think the awards culture is maybe dead. You know, I think maybe we're gonna be, I think we're gonna be hard pressed. I know the food industry is definitely probably never going to jump into an awards world again. And I think that's a great thing. You know, I think that's a really important thing. I think there was value in it, but I think we have to redefine what that value is. And I, I, it's, it's, it becomes really tricky. You know, it becomes a really tricky sort of like who's paying to play, who's, right. who's spending a ton of money on PR in order to get this and who's yeah. being left behind. Um, and that that became political in its own way, and it became a very play to pay to play sort of system. And I think we the the curtain got pulled back on a lot of the the fallacy of that this year. Um, while I just don't, I, you know, I don't think that I think that James Beard has grown into doing a lot more than awards, and I think that that's worth noting. But I do wonder if you know moving forward, we're going to have a redefinition of what our award culture looks like you know i, I feel like there's going to be a new definition of everything in culture movies uh, right? <laughs> you know i mean it's like this whole new rebirth yeah. that's like what the fuck is, like in my mind it's like a dream that yeah. we're going to just suddenly take our masks off and just walk away and it's, yeah that's just not going to happen yeah and it's, so it's this whole new way of connecting with people i mean now everyone's moving and everyone's it's changing the way we eat it's changing yeah. the way that we chat with each other and and connect and yeah i mean what has been for you um like personally this is maybe this is too broad of a question but um i'm curious like what what are you glad to not be taking with you next year like what are you glad to leave behind one thing um I mean, like anything at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, and 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 this might this is sorry to be crass, but I am not giving two fucks anymore. Yeah, Same. I mean, I'm, and excuse me, but like I'm just at the point where I feel like I went straight from being in college to then being a lead of a TV show to kind of being in that world and living mm -hmm. this rat race. And I took some time off for the last bit to have kids and think I had to raise or look a certain way. Like I, I got my tattoos removed when I had my first son. Oh, wow. And I noticed you got a new one this year. And I got a new one and I put my <laughs> old ones back on. Oh, and wow. Good for I, you. 
Yeah, well, it was just, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm close to, I'm, tur I'm turning 40 this next year. And I don't know if it's age. I don't know if it's that we've all been in hibernation and it's mm -hmm. really having to real do some deep, dark dives in ourselves. But I am at the point where if I had received the negative comments on this thread, it might have like really thrown me <laughs> at times, which is why I don't, I haven't done a lot of Instagram lives. Um, and I'm at the point where I think it's like what you're saying, like the negativity that's coming up or whatever, you know, criticism, it doesn't have to be negativity. Yeah. Um, it can't rattle me because yeah, I feel like I am who I am at this point in my life. And I wish I had known this self at 20 um, because mm. it would have saved a lot of heartache. But I'm yeah. at that point where I'm a good person and I just mm. want to do as much as I can in, the, in my life to be there for my kids, to put as much good into this world as I possibly can and give back yeah. and get to know people and be hungry and curious. And that also means yeah. letting go of, and of being wrong and mm -hmm. asking questions that might sound ignorant and stupid. Yeah. And that just means I can't, I can't give that. I can't give, yeah, I can't give a fuck. No, it's a beautiful thing. I think it's incredible. <laughs> it was really freeing. I'm, but you know, some days are different. But yeah, well, I mean, it's a practice like yeah. everything else. I mean, we're still hardwired the way we're hardwired. And, you know, I, I have been thinking a lot this year, especially since the book came out about all of the ways, you know, and some friendships have ended this year, you know, some long, important, I thought were important friendships have ended in a really painful way this year. And, yeah. um, you know, I have it's interesting. This is, I'm going to try to make this a short story, but no, I, I ended up getting back. I don't know why some account that I had was tethered to my Yahoo account. I haven't looked at my Yahoo account in probably seven years. It was from way back. I think Oh no. Is the husband calling? Oh no. Are you there? Oh, shoot. Lisa, where'd you go? Sorry. No, is your husband calling like mine? <laughs> no, it's, you know, this happened the other day when I was talking to Ginny Britton Bauer, um, and I thought I took it off both times, but I have the timer on my Instagram where it's like your time for the day is up and I keep trying to turn it off but I don't know how to turn I it do, off. I do it too I do it too so I was I anyway long story short I logged back into my Yahoo account and found several old emails about things that I had thought about you know you have these lingering worries and fears like oh did I piss off that landlord or was that was I not good enough to that landlord or did what did I do to make that situation worse things that you think about but you can't resolve you yeah. know and uh and I found these old emails and they were probably from I think they were from 2007 so 2006 to 2007 so over 10 years ago over a decade ago little yeah. Lisa like I was 20 so I must have been 30 at the time, 28, 29, 30 during yeah. this time of frame. And I, f I came across several chunks of emails, like several clusters of emails, uh, somewhere to that particular landlord. <laughs> and then the other set were to my sister's in law, who I had, you know, who I struggled with and I never could put the pieces together of what, what I had done wrong, you know? Yeah. And so it's always been sort of this after effect, like, did I handle myself right? right? Did I do right? And then as more time goes by, you let water be under the bridge and you just sort of hope you did the best. And, but you still wonder like, did I do, what did I, how could I have done that better is always my, like, how could I have, how could I have fixed that problem better? And it's always on me. It's always on me. I'm the same. I'm always holding myself accountable. And I looked at these emails and I felt so much compassion for myself. I was so 
I was doing so much of the heavy lifting of trying to make everyone communicate clearly and trying to communicate my intentions and what I was feeling. And I was being met with coldness and cruelty at every single turn. Yeah. And I was like, uh, like, it was so good to see. It was yeah. just good to see, like, I'm, I'm proud of the way I have behaved. I am proud of like, that I go, I used to go into every um, relationship situation just wide open, just yeah. wide open. And <laughs> I'll go with however. And then I realized as I was reading these emails, how much those things changed me, how much now I go in like guarded mm -hmm. and like, I don't want to overstep, like protective. protect myself, like don't you know, especially with other women, like, I don't do I can't can I trust other women? Can I like, what's this about? Like, if I'm too open, they think I'm being fake. If I'm not open enough, they think I'm being cold. Like, you know, like, yeah. where do I where do I get to just be me? And then there were so fast forward to this year, you know, I found that this week, just just yesterday, actually, or the day before. And I have been sort of thinking through a lot of these relationships. Not a, there aren't a lot. There are three, three relationships that I'm just done with in this, in this, at this, like no fucks given about it anymore. Yeah. And officially for my own sake saying, nope, I was wrong about you. And there's always that lingering doubt of like, am I the one being, am I wrong? Yeah. Like, 100%. But the reality like, is, yeah, the reality is as a problem solver, that has been the best gift for me. And it is absolutely, I give no fucks. Yeah. Because I know what I'm about now. Yes. And I don't have to like sit here and, and, and agonize over how I'm not right for you. Yes. No, <laughs> I love that. I feel Just the same. Do it. <laughs> that is so cool. It's not sustaining. That is not no. livable. You cannot no. live in that space. I'm the exact same, which is I go over, like I would go over things in my head oh, I, I really, I shouldn't have said that. I should have been nicer. I probably drank too much and I probably got too, I should call them and apologize. Mm -hmm. And then I'll like talk to like my husband who's there and he's like, you didn't do anything. Like, why yes. is this a call? And I'm like, because, because yes. I just want to be Same. liked and I want to make sure yes. that it wasn't me and I kept things like calm and good and fun. And it's like, what if I did fuck up? So yeah. what, then yeah they hopefully like me for me that i fucked up and didn't or didn't like yes i'd rather yes. have someone know my authentic self and yeah. worry about it all the time well and not taking i think i think you know I, I think that you can know your authentic self your whole life and still do yeah. too much to accommodate other people and and just tr it, like there's a point where people don't and i don't this is going to sound much colder than i mean for it to, to be but at some point you have to say, does this person deserve this much generosity from me? Yeah. And if not, I'm okay just keeping it for someone that does. And it's it becomes less personal and then it becomes less like uh, a beef. And it's like, yeah. okay, we go our separate ways here. And that's fine. You 100%. know? It, yeah. It's um, Ruiz, uh, The Four Agreements. And one of them that I love is don't take anything personally. Yeah. You know? And yeah. It goes both ways. If anybody wants like real time practice with that, just work in a kitchen, a professional kitchen. Oh my God. I can only imagine. <laughs> I, w I would go work. I would take jobs. Uh, you know, for a long time I cooked for, I, I did some private chef work for several years. And one of the jobs was for a couple of years. And the first thing I said to her was, uh, look, I promise you, nothing hurts my feelings. <laughs> you can tell me that you hate what I just cooked. And I want to know, like, I want that feedback. It, I promise I have no more feelings left to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing I, I can't, I don't have feelings anymore is eventually what I started telling my private chef clients. Like, I just don't have feelings anymore. I really would prefer to know if you like or dislike something. No, I I'll love be, that. Yeah, I'll be angrier if you are like eating something you hate. So well, the best people are your children. I mean, I don't know if you yeah. find that, but the best people to tell you like fucking full on honesty. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. I don't like you right now. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. You don't have to like me right now. <laughs> yeah. And especially as they get older, it's just becomes, uh, you know, conversations about, 
they keep you they keep you in in step with the right things you know um yeah I, you know my daughter is really good at saying i understand why you think that but you're you should probably think about not saying any of that publicly and really work <laughs> on why you still think that. like we got into a conversation two years ago i think one or two years ago about pronouns and i was like oh it's just such a waste of energy oh my god and she's yeah. like it's not it's not and so like she is very That's good awesome. at she's saying to yeah she's like do mom do you want to be you know an aggressor do you want to be a, someone who is progressing the conversation and i'm like yeah you're right you're awesome <laughs> so she keeps me from you know i think it's really at this point in my life, I want to be really true to, I think, my core. And at my core, I think it's really good to be around young people so they can remind you and keep you abreast. How to improve and grow. Well, they know, what, they know what's important and you should listen, you know? <laughs> Although my daughter lately, her big thing is, um, what is it? I will accept your apology, but it's not okay. Like that's her thing with everything lately. <laughs> okay. Dang, that's powerful. How old is she? Three. <laughs> Woo! She doesn't know it. I mean, it's because her older brother is saying that's it incredible. Her. I think it's great. <laughs> so funny. She's so wild. Ugh. Did we get any questions from the audience? I got a couple on mine, and I I should have written them down or sent them to you. No, I'm good. Um, so I think correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but I think that we have like basically 10 minutes otherwise it won't save so i'll make sure i'll throw in like some really quick questions um so okay um is our debt your daughter's name yeah <laughs> oh i'm just i'm looking at all the things just now it's sweet she's wild these three and your son is how old seven? um so sheppy turns seven on tuesday and then tom is eight <laughs> Oh my God. That's great. Yeah. They're wild. They're super fun. Um, and they're all so different and so wild and how mm -hmm. girls are like, they're just all oh so different. God. It's so crazy. Wait till, I mean, my son turns 21 in March, which is crazy. Oh my gosh. And my daughter is 16 and, uh, oh they God. are huge universes <laughs> they're just amazing i can imagine that's insane and i guess because i've just read the book i still think of your son as a baby and or i guess i think of you as pregnant with a daughter and <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> that's so crazy and wild um okay so let me get to uh, 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 uh um i'm starting to write a book on a website any advice on how to start a book on a website um I don't know, maybe a blog? Uh, yeah, I can't help you with that, but I can tell you, um, let it be really messy if you're starting a book. Oh, find, find your uh, find your sort of the narrative arc you want to follow. Um, kind of create uh, almost an outline. Not almost, create an outline so you know what path you're taking. But also maybe not, like maybe you just start. But I think the real key if you're like a, a gusher like I am, I'm a gusher. I just, whenever I, I start it. writing, everything just comes out. I have all these big feelings and I'm, I'm done yeah. trying to pretend that I don't. That's awesome. So the best advice I ever got was to just not be scared of how messy and terrible it's going to be. But don't and even that, say terrible. It's just going to be like dire well, in the no, mouth. It's, it's pretty just terrible. The, the trick is... <laughs> You will, and, 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 and you will be sitting there going, this is terrible. This is terrible. Write it anyway. Yeah. And that's the trick. The trick is you knowing or thinking. It might not be terrible, but you think it's terrible in that moment. <laughs> the, the key is to make sure you're still writing it down because the real craft of writing is the editing. The yeah, real craft of it. Same the real, within the acting, too. Yeah. The real craft is going back and then pulling out and not being scared to kill your darlings when you need to yeah. and cut huge chunks of words save them on another document so they don't die forever yeah. that's what you need to do i did that a lot where i just wasn't ready to let something go and so i had several auxiliary folders on my computer you're just so proud like i love this you're just so sure <laughs> you're <laughs> gonna <laughs> learn you're gonna use it somewhere you just know there's a place for it somewhere i've never looked at those pages ever again i don't even remember what I <laughs> what <got>. pages <laughs> but 
but I remember in the moment feeling like I couldn't live without those 400 words, yeah. you know, and yeah. I would cut, copy, I would copy, cut, paste it onto another document. So at least it felt like it lived somewhere. Yeah. And then I got immersed in the process of the thing. And I remember what, what it was. And it was clear that it needed to go. Yeah. You know, if you're, still, if you're still thinking about those words an hour after you've cut them. Yeah, OK, maybe go back and think about it. Yeah. But chances are you're going to realize very quickly it that. It makes sense. Yeah, you're like, oh, it's just, it's just hard to um, let go of the things that you think are so important. And then you read it as a reader and not as a writer. And you're like, that's better. Yeah. And I'm good at it, you know. And if you have the capacity, if you have someone in your life that you trust who is good at reading and writing I and my editing, life just get someone to like back you up. Like get your, get your manuscript to a place where you feel comfortable and share it with somebody with a red, red, red marker. Yeah. <laughs> with a marking pen. I mean, um, someone, has a really good, huge. someone has a really good question, which was, oops, sorry. Um, my, it's dark outside. So I have to change my camera thing. Um, someone asked, uh, has there been any criticism that's helped you with your book? Any like particular nugget that was like super helpful? Um, you know, I think we live in a world where people don't do that anymore. <laughs> And I, uh, you know, so no one was like, Hey, Lisa, this just this piece right here. I just I'm not feeling it. Like, was it just like, this is amazing. I'm gonna publish this. No, no. I mean, there have been emotional criticisms that you have to put into a, a secondary place <laughs> from the work. Um, there was plenty of emotional. How dare you? uh and uh you're a liar there is oh like from like other people you mean yeah there no, was forget of, them i mean yeah like, there's like... plenty of that kind of emotional criticism but people don't often say hey i read your book let's talk about this <laughs> like really? there's not a lot of that that happens anymore now if i when I get a little farther away from this moment, you know, the book just came out in August. It's still very much just out of my womb. It's very yeah. close to me still. And it's beautiful. Please, yeah. everyone, if you're watching, please go buy Lisa's book, um, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. It is fantastic. It's so Thank good. You. Uh, I think what I would like to do, I have some very good writer friends who I trust. Um, implicitly um and i would like to maybe just sit with them and say can you give me like an honest review like an honest like i want to do that with i have a couple of friends who are writers who i trust and uh you know I, I would love to have a meeting with them and ask them their thoughts as a writer and how i can be better i mean this is what i want to do for the rest of my life and this yeah. wasn't just a personality um memoir this was me for the first time getting to just be a writer and to That's work awesome. with the, I think the, the, the gifts that I want to like really hone and get better at. And I want to, I want to be doing this for the rest of my life. So I think as soon as I feel, maybe when the paperback comes out, <laughs> I'll sit with, you know, some friends. I have a couple of uh, friends in Nashville who are incredible writers, technically really great writers. Um, and contextually, like their con the content of their books, of course, are great. But like, I would just love to know, um, like some honest artist to artist feedback. Yeah. I need some more time. <laughs> no, I feel you. Yeah, I, you need to be distant from it for a little bit to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I understand that. Um, I really want to keep talking, but I'm worried it won't save. <laughs> okay. Oh, will it stop saving it after an hour? That's what I was told. Um, can anyone in the comments, is this true? Because I, again, I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to this. If we go over an hour... We can end it. We had some good. Ch we had. We touched on a lot of. Good okay, that's true. It's true. <laughs> Lisa, I might call you afterwards to continue this. No, seriously, I could talk to you all night. We should you just have Friday night. I love it. We need to do make it a thing. It'll be like the Buttermilk Road and like part two. Well, thank you for having me on. Oh my god, thank uh, you. This was incredible. And, I learned um, so much. This was awesome.
I did too. It was really fun. Let's we'll stay in touch. Let's but it was like this in front of people. <laughs> I love it. Thank you again. And thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Bye. Bye.